Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives or become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we get started, this program is brought to you by support of our listeners. I want to thank Christine for her support. And uh, this, of course, is our listener support campaign, and you can support the show by donating through support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, all year round, donations of $7 or more receive access to our premium site. But during our listener support campaign, which will run between now and March 9th, listeners receive additional thank you gifts with a donation of $20 or more. One item we do offer at the level of $20 or more is uh, Colonial Radio Theater uh, Productions. They've got some great ones, including adaptations of Perry Mason and Father Brown. As well, they've got a great uh, original Western series called Powder River, and they're recording their ninth season on that. And really, it's just great. We have a uh, company in America making modern uh, radio dramas. And one of the happiest uh, parts of the listener support campaign, in addition to support from you, is the thank you gifts when we uh, give these great plays. They entertain listeners with some uh, copyrighted plays we can't bring you on the show. Plus, uh, we're able to help support and further the great work of the Colonial Radio Theater. So those are available, donations of $20 or more, and they just keep getting better and better. You can uh, check out all of our options at support.greatdetectives.net. But now it's time for us to check in with the Crystal Lake Matter, parts three and four. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Betty Norton. I've been trying to call you. I know I was out. I'm sorry. You keep pretty late hours. It's after midnight. Did I wake you up? No. Good. Why don't you come over? The moon's real nice tonight. The lake is luscious. I'll come over, Betty. But not to talk about the moon or the water. Oh. Got something else on your mind, maybe? Yeah. A little thing called murder. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item six, two dollars. Tip to the Crystal Lake Hotel garage attendant for rousting him out of bed to get my car. I wanted very much to have another talk with Betty Norton, the wealthy, glamorous girl on the other side of the lake. She had told me she hadn't been with Edward Russell when he left the hotel bar the night he was murdered. But the bartender at the hotel swore that she and Russell had left together. If she'd lied about that, maybe she'd lied about a few other things. When I got to her Lakeshore mansion, she had a few well-spaced dim lights burning, a dreamy-type record playing, and some drinks mixed. The whole bit. Here you are, Johnny. Bourbon, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, You've got a good memory, Betty. Sure. I always remember what's important. Or what you want to remember. Same thing. Is it? How about the things you don't want to remember? Meaning? A couple of questions I want to ask you. Oh, now don't start making with those dull questions again. Look, let's just have a drink. (laughs) Last time I had to go swimming with you before you'd answer. This time it's got to be a drink, huh? I thought we might dance, too. With you leading, I suppose. Sorry, Betty. I know you probably own quite a few things in this world, but the list stops short of me. I want some answers from you, and I want them now. 
Okay, so be a party pooper. So ask questions. You told me you met Edward Russell in the hotel bar the night he was murdered. You had one drink with him and left. That's right. You lied, Betty. Who says so? The bartender at the hotel. Man, I've always tipped him so well, too. Look, baby, suppose we cut the comic routines, huh? All right, so I left the bar with Russell. Why did you lie about it to me this afternoon? It's very simple, Johnny. Part of the Norton training, I guess. What does that mean? My father told me long ago I could do whatever I liked, but to keep it out of the newspapers. That's the way I've played it ever since. Well, go on. On that night you're talking about, Russell and the bartender got into a fight. I know. And that's why I lied to you. Believe me. I just didn't want to be mixed up in anything that could land in the papers. I see. What happened then? He and I went to a coffee shop to sober him up a little. You can check that. I will. Then what? He kept mumbling about somebody named Billy was looking for. He say much about him? No, he wasn't making very much sense. And then Hiram came into the coffee shop. Who? Hiram, the old fellow who drives what passes for a taxi here at the lake. He told Russell somebody wanted to see him. Russell left with Hiram. And you didn't see Russell after that? No, I didn't. You don't look convinced, Johnny. I'm not. You lied once before, you could be lying again. Sorry. I told you I lied before, but this time it's the truth. Mm -hmm. We're going to get in touch with Hiram. His number's on the cover of the local directory. Local directory. This one over here? Yes. Okay. Johnny, at this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. He doesn't usually take calls after midnight. sleep around somewhere, I guess. Well, I'll check him in the morning. And... What is it? Shh, quiet. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? I thought I heard something outside here. Could it have been one of your servants? Well, I only have a housekeeper with me here, and she went to bed hours ago. Hmm. There are a lot of deer around here. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. Johnny, you call Hiram in the morning. He'll back my story up. It's crazy thinking I had anything to do with Russell's murder. What possible reason could I have? A pretty weird one, maybe, but it might fit. You told me this afternoon you had to play everything your way. You've probably been doing it most of your life and getting away with it. Maybe Russell wouldn't cooperate. Are you kidding? Look, men like Russell are a dime a dozen. So I had a drink with him and got mixed up in a barroom brawl. I should have known better. But as far as getting interested in him, I wasn't. Believe me, I can always find others who like to play it my way, as you put it. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, you kill me. That gold-plated front you put on. I wonder if behind it you aren't just a hollow, lonely kid. Thanks a lot for reminding me, Mr. Freud. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess that was a little out of line. I guess I was asking for it. But you're wrong about me not being able to stand anyone who doesn't play it my way. You see, I found someone who won't, and I kind of like it. Kind of like you, that is. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, oh, I guess don't I better... worry. I'm not going to try to appropriate you or, or to buy you. But about the loneliness, don't leave just yet, Johnny. Stay just a f few minutes more. Okay. Just a few minutes. I guess I felt a little sorry for her and her loneliness. Or maybe it was... Well, anyway, I stayed a few minutes more. I think it was just a few minutes. My watch had stopped. First thing in the morning, I tried to get Hiram the cab driver on the phone again, but still no answer. I headed for Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett's office. Clarence Bixby, who owned the cabin where Russell's body was found, was with him. Good morning, Johnny. Ants, Mr. Bixby. Good oh, morning, Dolly. Anything new? Not much. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Sheriff. Uh, however, I would like to ask a favor of you, though. What is it? So far, the Denver papers haven't mentioned which cabin up here the body was found in. Now, I'd appreciate it if it could be kept that way. 
Otherwise, if it got out, I'm afraid my chances of selling the place would be pretty dim. Yeah, and anybody who'd want to buy it for that reason would probably be the kind of person not very welcome here at the lake. Okay, Bixby, sounds reasonable enough. I'll see what I can do. <clears throat> Much obliged, sir. Cigar? No, thanks. Dollar? No, no thanks. Well, I'll see you later, fellas. I'll be around a day or two more if you want me for Okay. Well, how do things look this morning, Johnny? Just like Bixby's cigar wrapper. Hmm? I wish he'd quit tying those things in knots. Every time he does it, it reminds me that we're right in the middle of a knot we can't untie. Yeah. It's a bear, all right. Oh, brother, it's worse than that. A guy named Edward Russell takes off from his home in Denver and disappears. He turns up here looking for a guy named Bill, of which there are too many in this town. Then Bixby brings a prospect up here to show his cabin, too. He finds the padlock's been switched. Russell's body inside. Yeah. Ants, the only person who stood to profit financially on Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary on his $50,000 insurance policy. But she couldn't have killed him. The Denver police established her in Denver at the time. Oh, incidentally, she's up here at the lake now, Johnny. Oh, yeah, she told me over the phone you wanted her to confirm the identification. How'd she bear up? Yeah, not too well. It's kind of rough. You got any information out of Betty Norton? Well, her story is she had coffee with Russell after his fracas with the bartender... Hiram, the cab driver, came in and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Russell went away with Hiram. You checked with Hiram? I've been trying to get in touch with him on the phone. No answer. Yeah, he's on the go a lot. He keeps his cab behind the hotel garage. We can check there and leave a message for him. Yeah, okay. Yes. What about Bixby as a possibility? I thought of that too, Johnny. It had taken an awful lot of nerve to kill a guy and then arrange to discover the body in your own cabin, but... It sure would be quite a cover. Yeah. yeah. But like you say, it'd take more nerve than most men have got. Besides, we run a check on Bixby, and we've turned up absolutely nothing to tie him into the deal at all. Now, there's no evidence he'd ever known Russell. I know. Leona Russell can't remember her husband ever mentioning Bixby's name. I, uh... Hey, wait a minute. How about Putnam? Well, the guy who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin? Yeah. The same thing could apply to him. He knew the cabin was empty... He could have planted Russell's body there and then arranged for Bixby to open the cabin. It could be, except how does he tie in? I don't know. He said he and his wife wanted to buy the cabin. Might be interesting to check with his wife and see what she says. Not a bad idea, Johnny. I'll put in a long-distance call to her. Don't count on much, though. At this point, Ansel, I'm counting on nothing. And I wasn't. I was getting nowhere trying to match a logical motive with any of the suspects. I decided I might as well continue checking guys named Bill around town and see if I could find the one Russell had been looking for. I went down to Bill's boathouse at the landing. Bill Jensen ran. It was a stocky, heavyset man in his late 20s. His face looked friendly enough. That is, if you weren't paying much attention to his eyes. They were about the coldest shade of blue I'd ever seen. What can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Boat, maybe? A little information, maybe. What about? A man named Edward Russell. The guy who was murdered? What about him? Did he come around here to your boathouse? Not that I know of. Well, he was looking for a man named Bill, and I thought you might be the one. No. No, Aunt Garrett was telling me about him, but I'm not the one he was looking for. Sorry. Did you have to see him around town anywhere? Russell? Nope. First time I saw him was his picture in the paper after the killing. I see. Hey, you got quite a lot of boats here, Jensen. Yeah, pretty big investment in them. You keep the ones here in the boathouse padlocked, I see. No, I have to. Used to get one stolen now and then. Say, you want to take one out in the lake now, Mr. Dollar? Uh, not right now, Jensen. Maybe later. See you around. All of a sudden, I was real interested in Bill Jensen and his boathouse because some of the padlocks on the boats looked very much like the one that had been placed on Bixby's cabin door, the one he pried off when he discovered Russell's body. I wanted a closer look at those padlocks, but now wasn't the time. I went on back to the hotel to look for Hiram, but his taxi still wasn't there. So I left him a message to contact me as soon as possible. Then, after dark, I went back to the boathouse. There was nobody around. I slipped in the back and took a close look at the boat padlocks. Yeah, no doubt about it. They were the same kind as the one on Bixby's door. And one of them was missing. Yeah, Bill Jensen could be my boy. I hit the deck fast behind one of the boats and looked around me. It was a bad spot to be in. I was pinned against a wall. I edged toward the rear, then dove for the door of the tiny office. Then I 
realize my mistake. I'd figured that the office would have an outside door, but it didn't. I was trapped. Yeah, it looked like I'd just solved the murder. The hard way. Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I was out when you phoned a minute ago. Ants, get over here fast. Well, what's the matter? I'm trapped in the office of Jensen's Boathouse. I'm trapped? Look, I've got no time to explain. There's a man outside with a gun, and I can't hold him off much longer. Who is it? I don't know, but I've got a strong hunch it's the one who murdered Russell. And he's trying to do likewise to me. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, two cents. Just about what I figured my life was worth at the moment. The tiny office I was in had no windows and no outside door. A real trap. And outside in the darkened boathouse, somebody with a gun was stalking me. Probably the killer I'd been looking for. But now he was looking for me. I stacked what furniture there was against the door. He started throwing his weight against it, and it couldn't last very long. There was nothing I could do but wait. Right then, the sound of Ants Garrett's voice outside was just about the sweetest music this side of heaven. Drop the gun! Drop it! You okay, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. I'll get this stuff away from the door. Okay. Light switch here somewhere. There. Well... Bill Jensen. So you're my boy, Jensen. What are you talking about? What are you doing here anyway, Dollar? Getting shot at by you, mostly. Look, this is my boathouse, remember? You got no business to come prowling around here. Now simmer down, Bill. Simmer down. I thought he was a prowler, Ansel. Oh, yeah, sure. You knew I was getting close to you, Jensen. You decided to put me out of the ball game, and you came pretty close, believe me. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I figured it was somebody after my boat. Expect again. me to buy a hold story now, like that? Just hold it a second, both of you. If I can get a word in edgewise around here, maybe we can straighten things out. They're pretty straight right now, as far as I can see. Maybe. Bill, you claim you figured Johnny was a prowler trying to steal something, huh? How would you figure it, Ants? I see somebody sneaking into the boathouse and catch a glimpse of somebody else hanging around outside. Wait a outside. minute, wait a minute. Somebody else who? Man or woman? I couldn't tell. Whoever it was got out of sight mighty fast. Oh, sure. Pretty convenient story, Jensen. Somebody around here has been keeping an eye on me right from the start. But right now, it figures to be you. Look, Dollar, I'm... Hold it, Bill! A couple of Jensen's boats have turned up missing lately, Johnny. It's natural he might think that yeah, you... Yeah, and something else has turned up missing here, too, Ants. What do you mean? That's why I came here to the boathouse tonight in the first place. When I was here this afternoon, I noticed that the padlocks on his boats were missing. One of them was missing. They looked an awful lot like the one that Russell's killer put on the cabin door when he planted the body there. A lock's a lock, Johnny. Yeah, but one of Jensen's is missing. Don't forget that. Oh? Here, come here. Take a look. Right there. Yeah. And so it is. How about it, Jensen? I didn't even know it was gone. How do I know what happened to it? Somebody stole it. Probably the same guy who stole those boats last month. Look, look, if you're trying to involve me in Russell's murder, you're wasting your time. I didn't even know the guy, and you got nothing to tie me into it. No? Then you better listen to a few facts, Jensen. Edward Russell took off from his home in Denver and came up here to Crystal Lake looking for a guy named Bill, which just happens to be your name. Half a dozen other bills in town, too, Dollar. Now, what does that prove? Russell's body was found in Bixby's vacant cabin when Bixby brought a prospect up to show him the place. Bixby's lock had been taken off the door and a new one put on. Your padlock, Jensen. I already told you somebody must have stolen it from you. Then I come around to your boathouse here to check on the locks and you start throwing shots at me. You figure it out. You haven't got a case against me and you know it, Dollar. Just the same, Jensen. You better come down to my office with us. I got a few more questions I want to ask you. And I'd like to check your gun against the slug that killed Russell. Go ahead. Check it. Sure, I'll come down with you, Ants. I want to get this straightened out, too. But let me tell you something, Dollar. Next time you come around my boathouse without a search warrant, I won't miss. We questioned Jensen for an hour, but he didn't change his story. He kept denying any connection with the murdered man, Edward Russell, or his wife, Leona. Afterward, Ants and I went into his office. Uh, 
I don't think we got enough to hold him on, Johnny. Uh, uh, for one thing, his gun's a different caliber than the one that killed Russell. Oh, sure, he could have used a different gun, but we'd have to find it to prove anything. Well, what about the padlock? Mm -hmm. That's a point, all right, but it's our only point. Somebody could have stolen it, like Jensen said. A frame? Could be. <laughs> Jensen sure sticks to his story. <sighs> yeah. I threw everything I could think of at him, but he didn't crack an inch. Well, after all, Johnny, you were out of line going into his boathouse like that. So I should have had a search warrant. It wasn't time. You know, you got quite a knack for stirring up trouble. If you're wrong about Jensen and the other suspects, you're going to owe a few apologies. Apologies I don't mind handing out. But Russell's killer I want. You think I don't? Deputy Sheriff Garrett speaking. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, put it through. It's Mrs. Putnam in Denver, Johnny. Wife of the man who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin. Yeah. I put a call into her earlier. Hope... You... Hello? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Putnam. This is Deputy Sheriff Garrett up at Crystal Lake. Yeah, the reason I'm calling, your husband tells us you and he had been interested in buying a cabin up here for some time. I thought I'd check with you. What's that? You sure about that? I see. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Mrs. Putnam. Well, I guess your hunches are still clicking, Johnny. She didn't know anything about it, huh? Not a thing. Didn't even know her husband was up here. Look, gentlemen, I've already told you all about it. I saw Bixby's ad in the paper about his cabin here being for sale. It, it sounded like just a thing that... That that you and your wife had in mind, Mr. Putnam? Yes, yes, exactly. So You I... can hold it right there, Putnam. You lied to us. I most certainly did not. Your wife doesn't seem to know anything about it. Oh, my wife? Good Lord, is she up here? No, no, I talked to her on the phone. You, you, you didn't tell her about my wanting to buy the cabin? Yeah, Putnam, I did. You lied, Putnam. And there could be a pretty good reason for it. Look, I... You knew Bixby's cabin was empty. You could have planted Russell's body there and then pretended to want to buy the place so Bixby would open it up and the body would be discovered. It'd make a pretty good cover for you. Oh, gentlemen, please. I'm in enough trouble as it is right now without you piling more on. I had nothing to do with Russell's murder. I didn't even know the man. What do you mean about being in trouble, then? Oh, with my wife. Look, it's probably hard for the two of you to understand... You don't know my wife. Don't know your wife? What about? I did lie about her wanting the cabin. She didn't know anything about it. We know that. I just wanted a place to, well, to get away from her once in a while. Ants looked at me, and I looked at Ants. And I guess we both had the same idea. The idea that we'd run another in a long series of blanks. We heard Putnam out a long and familiar tale of woe. We could establish no connection between him and the dead man, so we finally left. We left him in the middle of a long sentence about what his wife said to him every time he got home from the office late. Anson and I went outside. The lake was silver in the moonlight, and a million stars were crowding the sky. A good night to be young, but at the moment I was feeling 90 years old. Getting you down, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, right now I feel like an old beat-up merry-go-round. <laughs> I've been going round and round, and my bearings are getting creaky. Yeah, the trouble is we've checked out just about everybody who could possibly be involved. It's murder that beats me, Ants. The only one we know of to gain by Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary of his $50,000 insurance policy. Yeah, but the Denver police established her in Denver at the time Russell was killed up here. Yeah, she couldn't have done it. We've got only one more lead as far as I can figure the guy who drives the local taxi here at the lake. Huh? Yeah. yeah. He keeps his car right over there in that shed. I know. That's why I was heading this way. Shed's empty, though. Benny Norton told me when she was with Russell the night he got killed, his Hiram came up and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Drove him away. Well, Hiram could have a line on the killer. But I can't seem to get a line on Hiram. I've tried to call him half a dozen times. I've left a message for him to contact me, but I haven't had a word from him. I don't like it. Our boys are looking for him. No sign yet. <sighs> well, we're not getting anywhere right now. Hey, look, if you're off duty, Ants, I'll buy you a drink in the hotel. Room. I am, and you got a deal. 
course, there's one possibility been in the back of my mind all along, Johnny. And probably in yours, too. You mean the killer could be somebody we don't even know about? A stranger? Yeah. Yeah, those are the toughest ones to crack. I know. Hmm. Lobby's kind of crowded tonight. We're getting into the busy season. Mr. Dollar. Hey, it's Leona Russell. Excuse me a minute, Anne. Meet you in the bar. You're right. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I didn't know you were still here. I'm leaving in the morning. The sheriff asked me to come up here and make an identification of the body. I know. Afterward, I just couldn't seem to get myself organized. I took one of the hotel cottages for a day or two. Such a peaceful spot up here. It's hard to believe... Yes, I understand. Uh, Mrs. Russell, your husband came up here apparently looking for a man named Bill. I've questioned two Bills so far, Cullen the bartender and Jensen the boatkeeper. Those names mean anything to you? Not that I recall. (laughs) That's what's so terrible about this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. There just doesn't seem to have been any connection between anybody up here and my husband. Why would anyone have done it? That's a good question, Mrs. Russell. And right now, we don't seem to have an answer for it. I went into the bar, but Anne's Garrett was nowhere in sight. The bartender told me he'd been called away. Expense account item eight, 75 cents, one drink. I waited. Still no Garrett. After a while, I went on the back of the hotel to check on Hiram's taxi cab. Nothing. The message I'd left him was still there. I went back into the bar, but Ants didn't show up. Finally, I went up to my room. Johnny Dollar. Ants Garrett, Johnny. Oh, hi. I tried to call you in the bar just now. They told me you'd gone to your room. I got tired waiting for you. Sorry, I got hauled away on official business. I'm calling from a gas station up near the three-mile grade. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here looking for Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, the payoff. A payoff with illegal tender. Hot lead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Johnny is definitely in a spot here because the cabbie could have given so much vital information as to where Russell went to. And you gotta wonder where Johnny goes from here. 
I had a hope that the uh, woman who was last seen at him didn't have anything to do with it. I thought they had a wonderful scene in part three. Uh, this case does seem to be getting to Johnny a little bit um, with his pressing of the uh, boat rental owner. Seems to be a little bit of the uh, earlier style of really hitting accusations without any real um, hard evidence. But I'm sure it'll all turn out for the best, at least for Johnny, on Friday. So join us back here for Part 5. All right, listener comments and feedback. And uh, we have this from Chris, who says, I greatly appreciate your podcast. It has occupied my time through monotonous tasks at work, commutes, and to put me at rest during travel to various locations. I've been a listener to of OTR in various forms since my mid-teens. I'm 34 now. Johnny Dollar, especially the Bob Bailey episodes, are, in my opinion, some of the best written radio stories of all time. Thank you for presenting them in a chronological fashion. Implies a certain feeling for the atmosphere and social norms of the time. Well, uh, you're welcome, Chris. Uh, he asked, I recently learned that F.A. Mitchell Hedges of Crystal Skull fame had a radio program out of New York in the 30s documenting his traveling adventures. I wondered if you had any insight into any survival record, surviving recordings of said program. Uh, thanks for all that you do. Well, Chris, thanks so much, and that's a great question. Uh, I looked into it, um, and I could not find any record of any surviving programs, which doesn't mean that they're not out there, but that it may be in some private collection somewhere. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any specific uh, uh, surviving episodes of that show. And really, in the 1930s, it, there was a lot of lost programs, and we still we didn't really have that um, great nationwide uh, system we had in the post uh, war era which is ma- which made in general a lot of uh, possible for a lot of transcription disc for a lot of shows to survive all right and uh, we'll go ahead and sign off i do want to encourage you to support our listener support campaign one thing we knew we've tried adding for this year and we'll see how it goes is I added some Golden Age um, comic book collections for those who, uh, in particular, follow the old-time uh, Radio Superman uh, program. So we have several Superman uh, collections from the 1940s, including reprints of Sunday uh, comic strips that are available as a uh, thank-you-gift choice. And we also have a Captain America Golden Age omnibus containing the first 12 issues of Captain America uh, magazine. I, and that one I added just because I'd referenced it on the war. But uh, those range uh, from thank you gifts from $75 on up. You can uh, check out the full list of items available at support.greatdetectives.net. Well, that will do it for today. Join us tomorrow for Nick Carter. We will be back on Friday as we wrap up the Crystal Lake matter. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.